Simone. Oh, 
Bhagavati Bhakti Yoga Bhagavati Tamnama Grahana Dibhi Tamnama Grahana Dibhi Etava Meva Lokesmin Etava Meva Lokesmin Ursam Dharma Parasmitaha Ursam Dharma Parasmitaha Bhakti Yoga Bhagavati Bhakti Yoga Bhagavati Tamnama Grahana Dibhi just returned to his shelter after being frustrated in an attempt to grab the subtle body and soul of uh, Ajahnil. And um, they're all confused. They don't know why they were thwarted in their efforts because their service is to take care uh, by securing and arresting those who are sinful and bringing them to Yamaraj for further punishment. So, but they were thwarted in their efforts because the Vishnu Dutas showed up and said, this is not your territory. <laughs> you have to go back. In other words, it was a big discussion and uh, ultimately the, the Vishnu Dutas showed by spiritual power and by transcendental knowledge that they had no right to take the soul of Ajamya. But now they're running back and wondering why. Now Yamaraj is explaining why that actually he is not the supreme personality, which the Yamadudas thought. But he is simply the representative of the Supreme Personality. And now he describes what is the glory of a devotee. And how that glory is free from being, what we say, influenced by anything material. So now he says, and he's explaining, devotional service, beginning with the chanting of the holy name of the Lord, is the ultimate religious principle for the living entity in human society. Purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. As stated in the previous verse, Dharma, Bhagavatam, real religious principles are Bhagavatam, the principles described in Srimad Bhagavatam itself, or in Bhagavad Gita, preliminary study of the Bhagavatam. What are these principles? The Bhagavata says, Dharma Projito Kaitavotra. In Srimad Bhagavatam, there, there is no cheating religious system. Everything in the Bhagavatam is directly connected with the Supreme Personality of Godhead. The Bhagavatam further says, Savai Pung Sam Paro Dharma Yato Bhakti Ahok Sujang. The Supreme Religion is that which teaches its followers how to love the Supreme Personality of God. So here's an important point. Uh, we find that there are so many goals in the practice of spiritual life and so many processes for elevating from one level of spiritual practice to another or even from the material consciousness into the spiritual. But all these are stages or steps processes of elevation, one must finally, ultimately, understand the goal and come to the goal. And what is the goal? Prema Pumartha Mahan. One must develop love for Krishna. That love is not, what we say, something that comes from the outside or something to be learned. It is something to be uncovered. So love of God, this verse is actually spoken in Chaitanya Charitamrita, the love of God is natural, it's innate, it's the quality of the living entity, 
just like the quality of fire is heat and light. The quality of sugar is sweetness. The quality of our existence is loving Krishna through serving Krishna. And serving Krishna and loving Krishna means pleasing Krishna through the process of serving Krishna. So that is, we might say, the only goal. That is the only goal. In a sense that all other goals are stepping stones that lead to the other goal or support the ultimate goal, which is to love Krishna. Or to come to that platform of loving Krishna. So the Bhagavatam says, okay, the supreme religion and that which teaches his followers how to love God, who is beyond the reach of experimental knowledge. Such a religious system begins with Tamnama Grahan Grahana, chanting of the holy names of the Lord, Shravanam, Kirtanam, Vishnu, Svarnam, Pada, save them. After chanting the holy name of the Lord and dancing in ecstasy, but gradually sees the form of the Lord, the pastimes of the Lord, and the transcendental qualities of the Lord. This way one fully understands the situation of the personality of Godhead. One can come to this understanding of the Lord and how he descends in this material world, how he takes birth, what are the activities he performs, but one can know this only by executing devotional service. So within devotional service, all knowledge is there. Sometimes it says that simply by performance of devotional service, one gets detachment from material life, happiness in the process of execution, and realization of the Supreme Personality of God. Just like when one eats, there's a verse in the 11th canto, explains that when one eats, one gets three things. One gets nourishment, happiness or enjoyment from eating the food, and cessation of hunger. So in the same way, simply by executing loving devotional service to the Lord, everything else follows. It's included. Isn't that nice? That's why Prabhupada would say, Krishna consciousness is so easy. He said, actually, if you're not awake, you'll miss it. It's so simple. But then again, sometimes we hear, and many, many other times, Prabhupada makes one statement in one section of the Bhagavatam, in the fourth canto, where he says that some people say devotional service is difficult. And some people say it is easy. He poses the question in one purport. Is it difficult or is it easy? Okay. Should we take a vote? <laughs> <laughs> and no, I won't ask you to do that. Okay. But the point is that the process itself is difficult. I mean easy, I'm sorry. <laughs> it depends how you feel when you wake up. <laughs> Sometimes you take a day. <laughs> it's 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 easy. That's what the Bhagavatam says. Mm -hmm. But what makes it difficult is the lack of one principle that is fundamental to the success of devotional service, and is called determination. So Balpa makes that conclusion after posing this question: What is the difference between easy and difficult determination? One who is determined, it's easy. One who's not, uh, <laughs> well, is there anything else I should do? <laughs> so determination is the foundation for the execution of successful development. But the essence of the process which makes determination develop is to glorify the Lord, and the glorification of the Lord falls into the category of various ways, but the essence of the glorification, as is mentioned here, is to chant Hare Krishna. Mm -hmm. <coughs> chant, oh, can <laughs> <I'm> tired. <laughs> but chanting Hare Krishna is a process of understanding that this means for success in all aspects of, of life is the essence, nothing else is needed. But then again, 
the process of devotional service is also there, which supports the chanting of the holy names. You'll find, if you read scriptures, you'll go, unless you hear from the acharyas, unless we get a clear understanding of how scripture is applied, you'll find scripture is contradictory. It's full of contradictions. Why? Because unless it is understood in the relationship to the execution of the process under the guidance of the spiritual master, it remains a secret. It's a secret. As Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, that, the, what is that verse 9-2 in Bhagavad Gita? Uh, number 9-2. Raja Vidya Raja Gunya Pavitram Idam Uttamam Parakshalam Dhamam Garmam Susukam Arkartam Avyayam. Susukam means it's a joyful process. So the joyfulness comes when one follows carefully the instructions of the spiritual master in executing the process of devotional service. As we were hearing from His Holiness Sachi Nandana Maharaj yesterday, that the chanting of the holy name of the Lord is accompanied by service to Vaishnavas. By serving Vaishnavas, or by having the mentality or the mood of service, this awakens the mercy of the Lord in the form of the holy name of the Lord. Without that, because the foundation for everything we do is association. Prabhupada said there are three things. Prabhupada said so many things. There are three things that are important in the execution of devotional service. You write this down in this order. Association, association, association. <laughs> make sure you get the order right. It's important to understand these things. So, the foundation for anything we do in Krishna consciousness is the association of Vaishnavas in the mood as Maharaj mentioned it so nicely yesterday, service, <coughs> the mood of service. The mood of enjoyment and jumps in there because Krishna consciousness is the highest form of enjoyment. There is nothing greater, right? Or else we wouldn't be here. <laughs> we understand that. There is no form of happiness that can compare to devotional service. Even a drop of the happiness in devotional service, as Rupa Goswami explains in Nectar Devotion, cannot compare to the, to the happiness of Brahman realization. Brahman realization is that realization that frees one from all forms of suffering. But that considers to be insignificant, just like a drop of water compared to an ocean. But the association of devotees makes that everything else so wonderful in the association of devotees. So Prabhupada goes on to state, he's, he's describing the power of devotional service. As stated in the Bhagavad Gita, Bhakti Amon Abhijanati, simply by devotional service one can understand everything about the Supreme Lord. If one fortunately understands the Supreme Lord in this way, the result is Taktva Deham Purna Janmani Naiti. After giving up this material world, he no longer has to take birth in this material world. Instead, he returns back home, back to Godhead. That is the ultimate perfection. So this is to return back to the spiritual world is the perfection of life. We can create that atmosphere here, but creating the atmosphere here means the developing the consciousness of those who, or the activities which leads to the consciousness of those of the residents of the spiritual world. I think it's mentioned many times that unless we qualify our consciousness to develop those qualities that are conducive to pure devotional service, one cannot enter into the land of pure devotional service. But the mercy is unlimited. So 
Prabhupada ends the purport by saying, mentions one verse, after attaining the great souls, who are yogis and devotion, never return to this temporary world which is full of miseries because they have attained the highest goal. So back to the chanting of the holy name as the fundamental principle for the execution of all success in devotional service. But again, it is coupled by the process. Srila Prabhupada mentions in one statement that simply by chanting Hare Krishna without following the rules and regulations, the rules and regulations, why are they? There are so many, so many rules, so many regulations. Don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, right? It's just unlimited. Prabhupada was talking to his devotees in one lecture. He says, yes, we are the society that tells everybody that don't do everything. <laughs> we got so many no's, he said. <laughs> Why? Because we're, we are trying to give you the understanding that the activities of the material world simply keep us in the material world. So the rules and regulations are principles that get us off the bottom <coughs> platform. And the chanting of the holy name takes our consciousness to the process of transcendental. So in the chanting of the holy name, Prabhupada mentions that one must follow the process. He says, without following the process of devotional service, he says, you may have a nice meal all ready to be cooked. And so you go into the kitchen and you get all the ingredients and then you get to the point where you're about to prepare the meal, but there is no fire, just smoke. You think, oh, well, anyway, smoke's better than nothing, right? <laughs> but how will you be able to cook your food with simply smoke? <laughs> so he mentions that without following the process of devotional service, chanting of the holy name is like cooking with smoke. So he said, well, you know, it may take you 300 years, because we don't want to wait that long, 300 lifetimes. But the process is so fundamental to the execution of devotional service because what is that process? Adal Strata, Sadhu Sangha, Bhajana Kriya, and Artana Vritti. And Artana Vritti is those uh, blockages that makes the process, what we say, difficult. What are those anarthas? Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur and also Vishwanath Chakrabarti Thakur gives very elaborate explanations of what are our Narthas. He puts them into four categories of form. The desire for material enjoyment, an Anartha. The desire for liberation, an Anartha. A desire to go to heavenly planets, an Anartha. A desire for mystic power, right? When we see someone who has mystic power, it seems like it's something very interesting and attractive, but it's still a consciousness of me. It's about me. And therefore, it still remains within the category of anartha. And then there is anarthas, the ones that we must avoid based on sinful activities, envy, fault-finding, to see the desire to become famous. Ah. The name is, the game is the name, not fame. So don't try for fame by using the name. That's not the game. It'll only bring you shame. <laughs> and everyone will only find money. So stay away from fame. It's not the game. That wasn't so good, was it? <laughs> <laughs> the point is that Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati explains what is the desire for fame. Krishna wants to make you famous. Krishna likes to glorify his devotee. When the devotee does something outstanding, or the devotee does something that is pleasing, Krishna is so 
he has such love for his devotee, he wants to take that opportunity to glorify his devotee, to reciprocate with the loving service of devotee. And he sometimes he gives so many opportunities for one to get glorification, recognition, prestige, or even material facilities. These all come by Krishna's arrangement when one executes devotional service. But the fame that comes by way of devotional service is not what we're talking about. But at the same time, the devotee doesn't want. He wants to make Krishna famous. Just like the word kirtan. Kirtan comes from the word kirti. It's actually the etymological root word of the word kirtan is kirti. And kirti means fame. So to perform kirtan in, in congregation means to gather together to spread the fame of the Lord. That is the actual essence of the name, the actual meaning of the word kirtan. But the Acharyas give a second uh, definition, and that is that those who engage in kirtan are actually famous. They become famous. Simply why? Because they're glorifying the all good famous Supreme Personality of Godhead. So one who is con connected with the Lord is also getting the mercy of the Lord in the same way. So, therefore, devotees become famous by performing kirtan. <coughs> we see. But at the same time, the devotee thinks, oh, I want to make Krishna famous. Because when Krishna is, Krishna is famous, to spread the glories of the Lord, then Krishna becomes, what we say, available to everyone. And that's what makes the devotee happy. A material fame. Should I give you the definition of Bhakti Siddhanta? Is what he said about material fame? You want to hear it? Yes. It's before breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> he said that a boar you know what a whore is, right? It's a male pig. <laughs> it's not a very nice animal. <laughs> and a boar is a pig, and we know what pigs eat, right? Okay. <laughs> All right, so when a boar, you know, has to also take care of nature, you know, it's, it's what is called recycled. <laughs> you can, you can okay. That's enough on that subject. <laughs> so it's recycled of the same stuff that you, you want to get rid of. So, so that's what he calls material fame. Everybody wants it. Everybody's looking for it. Right? Everyone wants recognition. Why? Because it feels like my existence has some meaning, some value. It gives me a feeling of happiness, security. But in the, actually it doesn't. It just just titillates the mind and senses. It doesn't touch the soul. The soul is only touched by the mercy of the Lord through the process of chanting Hare Krishna. So when we chant the holy names of the Lord, as mentioned, we want to glorify the Lord. We want to spread the fame of the Lord. To come together in this gathering, what we're doing this weekend, it's affecting the whole world. Everyone in the world is benefiting when devotees come together in a very loving and a very enthusiastic way to chant and, and, and dance and glorify the Supreme Personality of God. In. Everyone benefits. Why? Because when Krishna is pleased, he spreads that mercy everywhere. And the Prabhupada would always use that example. You water the root of the tree, the twigs, flowers, the fruits, the bread, is everything connected with the root gets the mercy of that watering process. Well, the whole world, it's not like we're just helping ourselves here. Actually, when we come together, because this is the highest form of activity that one can perform, as it says here, that in human society, devotional service is the highest form of, of the human being's expression. But in the essence of that practice of devotional service, there's nothing more glorious than chanting 
Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. His Holiness Sachi Nandana Maharaj has made his so his whole spiritual practice to focus on explaining, glorifying, and practicing the qualities and the essence of chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. Why? Because there's nothing greater than what we can understand. And the process of chanting Hare Krishna is the process of bringing the heart in connection with Krishna. The chanting of the holy name is actually coming from the heart. Goloka Premadana Harinam Sankirtan, it comes down into the lives of the great devotees. The great devotees speak about it and glorify it. They plant the seed in the heart of those that are following their practice. And in that seed, when it's watered through the process of hearing and chanting, it turns into a beautiful flower which we offer to Krishna. And that is bhakti. Bhakti means to offer your love to Krishna. And Prabhupada would make it sound so simple. He said, just try to love Krishna. Krishna is so nice. He's the most lovable object. People in this world are trying to find happiness in relationships. And that's natural. Everyone is doing it. But when that love is planted, or develop through our love for Krishna, then we can find that happiness in any and everything else we do in this world. Because that's where it starts. Without that, everything is like a cut-off hand. It, it's, it looks good, it functions, but it has no connection with the body, therefore it has no life. So the, the affections and the loving relationships in this world, without connection with the Supreme, are simply based on mutual exploitation. One will use another person simply to find some kind of pleasure in that relationship. And that's why nobody's happy. <laughs> that's why nobody's happy. Everybody's trying it and everybody is reading about it, everybody's writing books about it, everybody's seeing everybody else do it. Nobody's getting the happiness. Why? Because it's not real. It looks like it, it's, but it has no substance because the foundation of everything is coming from the source, and Krishna is the source of everything. Without that connection with anything we do, it is simply, it's like, you know, it's like a fool who dances around and expects to get popular. You know? <laughs> making a show, but there's no substance, and nobody cares about them either. So in the same way, when we connect with Krishna in everything we do, and Krishna says, just try to remember me. And here's the process to glorify the Lord by chanting the Lord's holy name. This is the easiest and most recommended way to remember Krishna. Srila Prabhupada, you know, you read the books, and you get an idea of the process of devotional service. But the essence is hidden in the hearts. Mahajano yena katasupata. In the hearts of the pure devotees, this is where you find the essence of Krishna consciousness practice and realization. So when we listen to those discourses spoken of Srila Prabhupada's books, by those who are practicing perfectly, or what we say enthusiastically, we get an understanding. And Prabhupada reveals many of the more intimate things in a more in a, in a less direct way. I'll give you an example. There was one devotee in our movement who loved to chant. He would chant ten hours a day minimum on Kirtan. His name is Vishnu John Maharaj. He was the epitome, or the highest form of, at least at that time, of devotees who were enthusiastic to chant. He would go out with the devotees on kirtan and he would play the drum for eight to ten hours. 
and just chant and go from place to place. Later, they, him and Tamal Krishna Goswami created a wonderful transcendental traveling party where they were going all over the United States spreading the glories of the Lord. Jai Sri Sri Rana Gopina Ji As Sachi Nandana Maharaj said yesterday, thank you, Pujari. Thank you. We thank him again. Oh, it's revealing the beautiful darshan of these. So, Mar so Prabhupada calls Vishnu John into a little discussion. He said, actually, if you want to know, understand the process completely, the process is to chant 24 hours a day. He said, this is really Krishna consciousness. To chant the holy name 16 rounds is the recommended way to get to the point of chanting always. See, this is the point. Chanting 16 rounds is not the minimum. It's the basis for getting a taste based on following the instructions of the spiritual master where we can come to the platform of always remembering Krishna by chanting a holy name. And Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur explains that. By chanting every day, he will chant always as we follow the process. And that's the goal. I've been doing a little research of Prabhupada's books, looking for verses and slokas and statements by Prabhupada, which explains or mentions the chanting of 24 hours a day. And I found so many, so many verses of Prabhupada, or even statements. And he says, the process is very easy. You just come and you engage in devotional service. You go to Mongol RT, you, you worship the Lord, and you serve in that way, and you chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra 24 hours. That's the problem. <laughs> so imagine there will be no Maya. There's no Maya. Isn't that? That's, is that okay? <laughs> oh, my, oh my God. When Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was traveling through South India, he, he came to one place called Kumbhashetra. And prior to his appearance in Kumbhashetra, there was one leper. He was the <laughs> worst inflicted leper. He had such a disease, but he was a devotee at the same time. His body was so wracked with leprosy that it says that there were worms crawling all over his body. But he was a devotee of the Lord, and his heart was soft. So it is explained, they would explain what was his nature when he would see one of the worms that would be in his body would fall out. He would take it and put it back, saying, this is the home of this worm. Krishna has given my body to be the home of this worm. It belongs here. That was his humility. That's how humble he was. And he was thinking, oh, I heard this great personality is coming through. I really want to see him. I know I can't speak to him because I'm such a diseased person, but I just want to see my home. But the Lord went so fast that he missed it. But somehow he didn't get darshan on the Lord. And then when he realized that the Lord had already left conversation, he was morose. He was so sad. He was beyond himself in sadness. Just see, all I wanted to do was just see the beautiful form of the Lord. But somehow or other, due to my misfortune, my bad luck, I wasn't able to. The Lord knows everything. He's in the heart of his devotee. He returned. He came right to the place of Vasudev. Vasudev was his name. And he, as soon as he saw him, the Lord enthusiastic went up and embraced him. Because he, he, he understood the heart of this devotee. It was so soft and so kind that when your heart is like that, Krishna wants to steal it. 
He wants to give you his mercy completely. He wants to give you his association. So when Vasudev was being embraced by the Lord, he was thinking, oh my God, the Lord is touching my fat body. This is so banal. I'm really going to hell. I'm offending the Lord. But the Lord was so happy to embrace him. And when he did, then the most mir not miraculous, we can know what exactly happened, his whole body became normal. All his leprosy was gone. Now, the question is, was Vasudev happy or was he unhappy? Any, any opinion? He was worried, but he was unhappy. Besides the Lord touching his body, he was unhappy for another reason. He was unhappy because he was thinking, now I have been favored by the Lord, now I will become proud. Now I will become proud. And the Lord understood his mind. He said to Vasudev, just chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, Always, and he said, you will never become proud. And Lord, the Lord gave that message for all of us, that by taking shelter of the holy name of the Lord, always, then why is not there? Why is not there? So, as I think Sachi Nandana Maharaj and other senior devotees were mentioning, we come together, we get full of the association of so many wonderful Vaishnavas, we have such a powerful spiritual experience. We take that with us and we live it. We live it, we, we, whatever we experience, whatever spiritual gain we've got, we continue and to glorify the Lord and to serve the Vaishnavas. So these opportunities to associate with devotees and such, it's so rare. It's the spiritual world. This is what we do in the spiritual world. Chant, dance, there's prashad too. Of course, without that, one cannot continue. And to associate with devotees. So the glories of the holy name makes everything wonderful in the association of Vaishnavas. So this is the process. And if we continue that way, then in the just a matter of time, then our hearts will become free from all tendencies to try to enjoy this material world. It's very difficult to get rid of that enjoying mentality. Why? Because to enjoy is natural. It is natural. The soul is by nature ananda, but in connection with the material mind, and none that gets perverted towards material uh, desires for happiness, satisfaction. But the power of the Holy Name that it uproots the weeds, or the actually the root, that is the foundation of material enjoyment, and destroys that the process of Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So, I'll stop here. Any questions or comments? Sachi Nandana Maharaj, thank you for coming. Thank you for, please correct all my mistakes. No, 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 no. It was wonderful and very very eye-opening when you uh, many points, but I want to ask you on on one point. Uh, after Vasudev uh, had been embraced by the Lord, he had this fear, my God, now I have this first class uh, healthy body and so on. Uh, that, may, uh, that may be dangerous for my further spiritual development. Pride may come. Mm. I, I wanted to, to ask you, it, it seems it's easier when you, 
when everything is not going fine for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think you could speak in with great realization of this. <laughs> Maharaj, uh, Bhakti Siddhanta says one thing. I don't know if you're going to like this. But <laughs> he said, for those who are favored by the Lord, the path of devotional service is strewn with thorns. <laughs> Why is that? Because it's so difficult to break our attachments to this world. So Krishna gives us these difficulties simply so we can go, we can take shelter of him. So we can call out to him, we can cry out to him. And to help us realize that this is the nature of this material world. It's simply a place of suffering. Yeah. So that to get that realization, it's not that we look for these things. And it's not recommended to look for them. But, you know, it's like saying in the material world, it's like, you know, it's winter time. Right? So somebody would say, boy, it's cold. Well, it's winter. It's natural. It's natural. So in this material world, miseries are simply the way of the way in the material world. Even the happiness you get in the material world is another form of misery because it makes you forget. It can, it can make you forget about the role of life. We see that those who are very, sometimes very materially successful, they can't humbly offer their you know, heart to the Lord because there's so much, what we say, support from their material success. Particularly those who are wealthy, Bhagavatam says of all the forms of material success, wealth is the greatest one to give up, the attachment to wealth, because it leads to so many other forms of material enjoyment. So, yeah. So, Queen Kunti, she prays. She's, a, she's Krishna's aunt. She's a great devotee of the Lord. But she has such prestige within her position as being the Ad and a, a member of the Yahoo dynasty. She's thinking, I'm surrounded by aristocratic well relatives, everything is nice, but this is making it very difficult for me to call out to you with great feelings. So she prays for calamities. Let those calamities come again and again. By, by, that way we can see you again and again. So she's praying in that way that, please give me some difficulty because I'm attached. I'm attached. Now, we don't recommend everyone to make that prayer, but if you can, <laughs> it works. <laughs> Sincerely. But I like, you know the prayer I like? One of, I think one of my favorite prayers was given by Bhakti Tirta Swami. When he made this statement in front of the entire Mayapur, GBC, and all the thousands of devotees, he said, I want to offer a prayer, and I would like to make this prayer a standard within our society. And what is that prayer? <coughs> My dear Lord, whatever is there in my life that is blocking my relationship to you, please take it away. Second half, my dear Lord, whatever's in my, whatever I need in my life to open up my relationship to you, bring it on. So he's praying for bring out whatever I need and take away from whatever I don't need. That's a perfect prayer. Everything is included in that prayer. So when we offer that type of prayer or something similar to that mood, then Krishna sees, oh, okay. And he makes arrangements directly for his devotees to come closer to him. So, yes, they say, that the, the Bible says, for a rich man to go into the kingdom of God 
is it's more easier to put a candle through the eye of a needle. Yeah, that's the statement. So therefore, those who are endowed with a lot of material success or amenities, qualities, just use it for Krishna's service. It becomes glorious. We can't enjoy it. Does that help, Mark? Thank you. Yes. <coughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. There was a question in the back. Yes. I'm, I'm very happy that I came to your class. It was really touching. I'm happy you came also. And, and I'm very happy I recorded it because the atmosphere you brought, it's forgetful. We forget things very fast. So I'm very happy I recorded it. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> nice service. Anyone else would like to question this? Maharaj, you said something about um, uh, knowing about the Lord. Knowledge of the Lord? Knowledge of the Lord. Could you please, um, well, I, I read somewhere that Prabhupada said that we should discuss with dev devotees. I think it's the first part of the Bhagavad Gita. How do we facilitate, facil facilitate this? Because everybody's so busy. It's a practical question. And the question is how to bring about discussions of the Lord. Well, when you come together with friends and others, you can just start speaking something Krishna comes But even in a more direct way is you can organize. Have gatherings where you can you just you you have a systematic study of the Bhagavad Gita and you just discuss. I was I had I had the good fortune to take part in a discussion group started by devotees. Uh, somebody would come and pose a question, and then all the devotees would give their comments on that particular question. Something that was really difficult to understand. And that way, that as Prabhupada said, we should he says, we should study his book from all angles of vision, not just you know, just read it, but discuss it. He says there, there are unlimited meanings in every every, every sloka. So start a little discussion group. Actually, the discussion group was in the UK. So yeah, so it's, yeah, I think it's still going on. We try. Okay. Okay. Yes. I was wondering you were talking about an act as they block. I mentioned only a few, yeah. Um, the ones that are the worst ones I didn't mention yet. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow I got sidetracked. I was wondering how do you systematically work on an artist to, to break them down? Mm -hmm. Do you work on individually or do they naturally just dissipate in each other? Um, well, in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, it mentions that as the plane of bhakti grows through the process of watering, the weeds also grow up along with the plant. This is also there. So one should recognize, learn to recognize these weeds, and therefore diligently try to avoid it, and at the same time, try to follow the process because the process will help to uproot the weeds but if we're not aware it may be very slow when you're aware of something then it's easier to see it and to somehow or other avoid it you know we, we, we see certain tendencies in ourselves that we don't like so when those tendencies starts to come to the surface, we can just somehow or other try to avoid acting on those tendencies. <coughs> you can't just be yourself and then say, well, you know, what's the... I don't feel humble, therefore I will not be humble. Because I'm not feeling it, therefore I should be real. Mm, yes. I have to be real. I have to be honest to my feelings. No. It's not the way it works. The thing is, humility is natural to the to the soul, and therefore, when we're not in that consciousness, we're in something that is 
unnatural. We're in that mood. So therefore, one practices what is the qualities of the soul, or what is the qualities of the mode of goodness, which leads to transcendence. And so we can't just act on feelings, because feelings come and go. And they're, just, they're just experiences of the mind and the senses. Does that help? Yeah. That's pretty good. But I had the experience that when I was in Buddhist distribution, many years ago, then uh, you attend more because you were like in this kind of pressure condition and then you have the tendency to chant more. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think is that if you look to some kind of like, like these missionaries in the past, they went to countries that put themselves in danger <coughs> and put their, themselves much closer to God than in comfortable situations. Mm -hmm. so well, Prabhupada said, one should take a risk for Krishna. But then he also said, one should not take a risk where one puts their Krishna consciousness in jeopardy. So he was tempering the statement that it's nice to take a risk for Krishna. Go beyond, go beyond what is easy to serve, to preach, to do, do something to help bring Krishna consciousness to others. But then again, you don't want to go in the situation where, you know, you're going to fall down. So you have to kind of balance that out. So I mean, if you go out of books, that's recommended. Uh, if you want to go to, like, all alone into one country that's never been, you know, Krishna conscious alone, doesn't have a temple there, and you go all by yourself with nothing. It might be, might be too difficult. So you might say, "Well, I should go with a few devotees instead of going alone." In other words, risks are recommended, but not to the point where we're going to fall down. You have to save ourselves first before you can save anyone, and that's simultaneous. When we see ourselves getting weak in Krishna consciousness, then we should take more time to do the needful. More chanting, more reading, you know, whatever is necessary to, again, build our strength back up. Because you can, get, you can only give as whatever you have. So. Thank you, Hare Krishna. Yes, Prabhu. Thank you for the wonderful lecture. Um, I would like to ask uh, concerning the question about an artist. Um, I also heard sometimes Prabhupada say to his disciples how it's important to meditate in Krishna's lotus feet. But I'm not quite sure why is it, con how and how it, if it is and how it is connected to an artist. Maybe you could explain well, this. Krishna's lotus feet is the, what we say, the composite of everything spiritual. Everything is there in his lotus feet. His lotus feet indicates pure loving devotional service. And Prabhupada has also made that statement many times. There's one statement where he says, if you remember the lotus feet of the Lord, you will never find any impediments in the execution of your devotional service. That's there. That one I, I, I have that one is one of my favorites. <laughs> so trying to remember the lotus feet of the Lord, trying to remember Krishna in the form of the holy name and how different. You know, the only difference is in this age it's recommended to chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra also. But Krishna's lotus feet is non different than his holy name. <laughs> so that's why we take Didi Darshan, because we take that form in our mind, and then we can remember that form throughout the day. Yes. Yes, Prabhu. There is not a Krishna. Do we have time? Or yeah, I, I don't know. I can't see any clocks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, here is one right here. <laughs> Sorry, that's still... Yeah, it's five to nine, so we have maybe a few minutes. This is a question that we never dare to ask, so I beg forgiveness if I say something wrong. It's very nice that you mentioned Vishnu Jams for me. Mm -hmm. 
and give us some some guts to ask because we are here in the Dutch Mellows. Um, the message is connect, connect, connect. Don't space out. Bring all your everything into the holy name. But I read once in the that's why I have to draw a parallel to it's nice to connect to the holy name. We have also a tendency to mispronounce the mantra. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, 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 Rama. I mean, you put it, when you say the O, oh, you can put a little more feeling into an O than you can in an A. Oh, oh, it's a little harder. So, yeah, in that, you're referring to the Prabhupada's discussion with Vishnu John Maharaj? So he said, what is this Ramo? Yeah. <laughs> Go on, Dandavats, 2013, October 12th, I think something like that. If you go on Dandavats, look up some of the old entries. It's, that's posted there. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, we have to be a little bit conscious because the acharyas want us to chant the holy name nicely. So, I mean, Krishna is Baba, what is it, Baba Hig Janardana. That's the name of Krishna. It's one of his qualities. He takes what you want to say. Not so much the actual words, but he's taking your heart. But the acharyas want us to do everything nicely for the offering to the Lord. So we follow that. So, And it's just the tendency of ecstasy sometimes that we don't really uh, become so conscious of exactly <coughs> how we're chanting. So it's important. So yeah. So try to avoid the O's and Ramo. <laughs> I always think of Ramo, who's that, an Italian barber or something? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's Rama. I, I, I was leading one kirtan in, um, in Mayapur. I was Mongolarti at the end. And I was very conscious of this saying Rama. And one lady came running up to me and she said, Thank you, Maharaj. All the sannyasis in there, they all say, Yo, oh, oh, oh. And you said, Ah. <laughs> Well, you may be a little extreme here. <laughs> it's, it's a few of us that make a mistake, but uh, don't be so heavy. <laughs> so, so, but yeah, I think your point is well taken, and it's, and it's something that I also feel very strongly about, that we should be careful to pronounce the name nicely. Pronunciation helps meditation. And that's one of the qualities of correct pronunciation. It gives us a deeper form of meditation. Like that. It enhances the quality of meditation. So thank you. Oh, yes? Just a little question. I was once chanting in Mayapur, and uh, the harmonium was broken. And then two went out and they said, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Welcome to Bengal. <laughs> <laughs> it's a nice place. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Shiva Prabhupada.